is overwhelmed and I cannot hear your voice. I'll hold on to what is true, though I cannot see. If the storms of life, they come and the road ahead gets steep, I will lift these hands in faith. I will believe. I'll remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have because of your son. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. And I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high or valley low, I sing out, remind my soul that I am yours. I am forever yours. When my heart is filled with hope and every promise comes my way, when I feel your hands of grace rest upon me, staying desperate for you, God, staying humbled at your feet, I will lift these hands in praise and I will believe. I'll remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have because of your son. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. And I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high, your valley low. Well, tonight, we light the candle of love, recognizing that Jesus is love come down, piercing through the preconceived ideas on what a God should be and was born a baby to a young girl named Mary. He walked alongside us, befriended us, taught us, healed us, and then eventually died for us in an act of salvation for our iniquities and shortcomings. John 3.16 famously says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And on this Christmas Eve, let us remember, friends, that Jesus came into this world to pay a debt that should have been our own. And he died a death that should have been ours, and he rose again, declaring those things, those shortcomings, those iniquities, our sin. He declared those things done with so that we may be free from the shackles of death, despair, and darkness. So we light this candle, remembering that Jesus is Love come down to save us. Well, good evening, Northminster. My name is Nathan Rodriguez, and I am the music director here at NPC. Welcome to Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas, y'all. You've made it. Whether you're a first-time visitor or a lifetime member of Northminster, we are so glad that you are worshiping us this evening. And to those who are watching online, thank you so much for being with us here as well. I'm going to keep this brief, so stay with me. Here at Northminster, we have a call to move in, up, and out. And what that simply means is that we move in community with one another. We serve one another, and we serve alongside one another. We are also called to move up, that we engage in the Word of God together in Bible studies being here Sunday mornings, 9 a.m. And we are finally called to move out into our community, into our community that the church is not four walls and a roof, a couple hours on a Sunday morning that we are active in our community and are the hands and feet of Jesus. When you walked in, you were handed a connect card and all that really is is to let us know who you are and let us know you are here. We also wanna give you some information about our church and about different opportunities that we move in, up and out together. And on the flip side, you have a place where you can submit your prayer requests. We want to get the opportunity to pray for your situations and your circumstances. So if you wish to do that, there it is. And after this service, you can drop that card off in the blue buckets in the back of the room over there. In this season of Advent, we have been navigating a very simple yet powerful series called The Story of Hope, Peace, Joy, and Love, where we focus on each of the candles of Advent and those themes surrounding the birth of Jesus. I got to watch out when I wave around so I don't knock one of these candles out. Today we work backwards though. We are calling this night the story of Christ. Not simply because we are lighting the Christ candle, but because we are telling the story of Christ's time on earth and asking the simple question of why. Why did God and Christ orchestrate this incredible story of hope and peace and joy for all of us. And because we have ta talked about love, let's talk about joy. In Luke's gospel on the road to Jerusalem, Jesus approaches riding on a donkey, and Scripture says as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This joyful outcry was a response to Jesus' faithfulness. He had healed the sick. He has raised the dead, cured the lepers. And they were filled with joy at the amazing ministry and miracles that they had witnessed but we know what happens next. We know the shift in the story when darkness surrounded the earth on the day of Jesus' death. But we still have more to that story. And the grave did not and could not hold him, and he rose victorious, conquering over death and darkness. And we celebrate that today. We celebrate when the day Jesus comes back and completes the work. 
So let's stand and let's worship the risen Lord that humbly came to the earth as a baby for you and for me.
that God, he is faithful, and he calls us to keep our eyes on him. The winds and the waves do not respond to our voice, but to his alone. So let us celebrate that and stand and sing about the Prince of Peace, Jesus.
This is what the angel said in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. And if you know the words, just fill them in with me. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. Now hold on to that scripture for just a second. We'll get to it in a minute. But first I want to ask kind of a non-biblical question. What's your favorite Christmas movie? And, you know, we got too many people here to go around and ask what yours are. Uh, so we're going to tell you it survey style. So I've got five in mind, and just raise your hand if this happens to be one of your favorites, okay? So first one, It's a Wonderful Life. We see your hands. Wow, well, 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 Mr. Potter, you're just a warped, old, frustrated man. And that goes for the rest of you, too. Number two, White Christmas. Danny Kay, all right, Bing Crosby. And uh, if you want a White Christmas, by the way, then uh, um, watch the movie because I think it was 60 degrees when I came here today. All right. Number three, who is a fan of the hap, hap, happiest Christmas movie of all, Christmas Vacation? Oh. <laughs> Keep your hands up if you have a cousin Eddie in your family. <laughs> Keep your hand up if you're sitting next to them. No, I'm kidding. All right. Number four, Elf. All right. Yeah, I figured I'd see some of the kids raise their hand. And then 
Number five, all-time favorite Christmas movie, Die Hard. <laughs> Three people. Okay, good. Let's go back to that scripture. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace Goodwill to man. I mean, how many times have we heard those words? How many times have you heard those preached at a sermon? Or maybe you grew up in Sunday school and your Sunday school teacher taught you them. You, you set them on Christmas cards. You may have them on your refrigerator right now or a plaque in your house. Now I want you to think about how you would feel if you heard those words for the very first time. So just imagine for a second that you were not a Christian. And somebody said to you those words, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth. Goodwill to man. How would you respond? Well, here's my conclusion. I would say, hey, you know, those are really nice, pretty, sentimental words that have absolutely nothing to do with the real world that I live in. Peace on earth, goodwill to man. Are you kidding me? I don't see it anywhere. I mean, let me give you some statistics. Since 3600 B.C., the world has only known 292 years of peace. In that period, there have been 14,530 war wars, large and small, where 3 trillion 640 billion people have been killed. Since the beginning of time, there have been over 8,000 peace treaties written between nations. And those peace treaties were meant to last for you know, a long, long time. Anybody want to guess how long the average length of those peace treaties were? Yeah. Two years. Peace on earth? Goodwill to man? Now, I am inclined to say, along with Ebenezer Scrooge of the Christmas Carol, bah, humbug. So, What's this thing about peace on earth, goodwill to men? Is it really true? Can we believe it? Okay, let me ask it this way. If Christ came to bring peace on earth, why is there so much hatred and so little peace? If Christ came to bring goodwill toward men, why is the promise of Christmas unfulfilled after 2,000 years? Now, understand something, okay? These are not the questions of some belligerent, agnostic person. Those are honest questions. And I think they deserve an honest answer. And I have one for you tonight. Here it is. There is no peace on earth because of the condition of the human heart. This is what the prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That means... Jeremiah said that your heart is wicked, and my heart is wicked. It means that left to ourselves, we'll do the most terrible things imaginable. We'll cheat, we'll lie, we'll steal, in some cases, even murder. I mean, sometimes the only thing that holds us back is the fact that well, we're just afraid of getting caught, or maybe we just don't have the opportunity to commit every sin that we think about. That's us, Jeremiah says. Now, Nathan, I'm looking at these people that you were just saying it to Come on. What a nice group we have here. You are taking your Sunday evening, 7 o'clock Christmas service, to come to a church service where you could be at home with your family. What's this about being so evil and deceitful and wicked? But the truth is, and I'm including myself in this, all of us, by nature, are materialistic, selfish, greedy, self-centered, and the Bible says that we are fools if we think anything else is true. See, the prophet Jeremiah had it right. The real promise is the universal condition of our human heart. So you want to know what's wrong with the world today? Just look in the mirror. The problem is you, and the problem is me. So when you sort through everything, the answer is clear. There's no peace on earth because we're not peace-loving people. We're not peace-filled people. We are anger-filled and hate-filled and lust-filled and greed-filled. What, what did we just sing? Oh, come, oh, you unfaithful. That's us. That's us. No wonder we have problems. 
No wonder there's no peace on earth. This is the way that the Apostle Paul put it in Romans 3, 10 through 17. There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They've all together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. So if there is no peace on earth, the problem is not with Jesus. The problem is not with the angels. The ultimate problem is the universal condition of the human heart. And I think I know just a little bit about the condition of the human heart. In 2006, on September the 25th, I got up in the morning and I went into the kitchen to make a pot of coffee and my wife who was in the bedroom heard a loud thump and she thought it was I dropped the coffee pot on the floor so she came in to investigate but it was not the coffee pot on the floor. It was me, collapsed and unconscious. So she called the paramedics, they took me to Methodist Hospital ER and on the, laid on the emergency bed, uh, room bed, they, they said that, that two of the four chambers of my heart were not firing. So they kept looking at the data and monitors and things like that. And then I said, oh, I'm starting to feel that again. And I blacked out, and then all four chambers of my heart stopped working. So I was essentially flatlined uh, for 25 seconds. When I came to, I saw a bright light. It's not good. <laughs> but it wasn't Jesus. It was the nurse who said, you are going to have a pacemaker put in. She put a clipboard in front of me. I signed it. And that afternoon, I had a pacemaker put in. All right. Fast forward 10 years. 2016, uh, a battery in a pacemaker only lasts about 10 years. And it was about out. So they said, you're going to go back and you're going to get a new one. But they don't put in a new battery in a pacemaker. They put in a brand new pacemaker. So they did in November of 2016, along with an infection. And that started to manifest itself where the pacemaker cut was and about Thanksgiving and then early December, mid-December, and it got worse and worse. And you know, by Christmas Eve, this time 2016, it was really pretty bad. And I tried to clean it up by myself. I used rubbing alcohol. I used betadine. I used hydrogen peroxide, band-aids, whatever I could think of. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, at the first week of January 2017, um, I was in Methodist Hospital again, and the infectious disease doctor in Peoria said, you are going to have to have that whole thing taken out and cleaned out, and then you get a new pacemaker. I know, I don't want that. Come on, you, it's some, you can give me a pill, you can give me an injection, something. No, it won't touch it. I can do it myself. No, you can't. You've got to have it done. So I went to Chicago last week of January in 2017, and the uh, University of Chicago doctor there took it out, cleaned it out, but then he looked at my records. And he said, Bob, you were misdiagnosed in 20, 2006. Um, you did not have sick sinus syndrome. Your internal God-given pacemaker is fine. Your heart is fine. You have vasovagal syncope. And you had a bad episode of that. And we think it was caused by some cold medicine. So if you will avoid cold medicine and just drink a lot of water, you'll be okay. I could do that. But I said, well, I want a second opinion. So I went to Northwestern University, uh, which the top medical doctor there, who was sixth ranked in the nation, said, yeah, I believe that University of Chicago doctor is exactly right. Um, you did not have the sick sinus syndrome. You've got, you know, vasovagal. So no pacemaker. Cleaned it all out. Here I am. Now, why am I telling you all this? When I was at Methodist Hospital, the infectious disease doctor from Peoria said, Bob, if that infection goes down that lead to your heart, it will kill you. 
I didn't realize that I had an infection that I could not take care of myself. I had to have someone outside of me take care of the infection in my heart. You see where I'm going with this? We have an infection called sin. And we try to take care of it ourselves in every way imaginable. It just will not work. We need someone on the outside. And folks, that is the good news of Christmas Eve. That's why you're here tonight at 7 o'clock to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ because there is good news. There is an answer to the infection of sin. It's when Jesus Christ comes into your life. That's when peace on earth and goodwill toward men happen. But listen, we've got to understand this right. Look at, if you happen to have a Bible, uh, Luke 2.14, carefully. And this is the English Standard Version, by the way, which is very accurate. Listen to what it says. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Did you get that? There's a qualifier to peace. The peace of God doesn't come to everyone. It only comes to those who know God. Uh, maybe you've seen this on a bumper sticker, perhaps. No God, no peace. No God, no peace. We can know peace on earth and goodwill to men at Christmas. So let me tell you about that movie that I didn't mention in the top five that my wife and I just watched last night for the very first time. I don't know if any rest of you have seen it or not. It's not the most celebrated Christmas movie at all, but it had a profound meaning to me. It's a movie called I Heard the Bells. Anybody seen it? There's just a very few people. It's an amazing movie about the story of the song that maybe we sing sometimes at Christmas, maybe you sung it in your worship services here, that starts like this. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Those words were written by the most celebrated and famous man who was a poet during that time, during the Civil War period. Anybody know his name? Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Longfellow wrote those words during the Civil War period. And Longfellow's son in 1863, Charlie, felt that it was duty to go on to the ongoing fight of the Civil War between the North and the South. So he became a soldier for the Union. And Charlie missed the Battle of Gettysburg due to an illness, but he did fight the Battle of Mine Run on November 27th, where he was shot. The bullet entered his left shoulder, grazed his spine, and went out behind his right shoulder. And he was shipped back to Washington, D.C. for surgery. So on December 1st, 1863, Henry Longfellow was eating dinner and a telegram informed him that his son had been shot. So he and his youngest son immediately left for Washington, D.C. to care for Charlie and hopefully nurse him back to health. And when he got to D.C., Charlie was examined by surgeons who felt like, well, his surgery and recovery may be complete, but for the time being, he was partially paralyzed. So during this time, Henry Longfellow, this famous poet, looked around and all he could see was heartache, disaster, unbelievable grief, a world that went crazy. And these are the verses he wrote. Then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south. And with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to man. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to man. Man, that's pretty depressing. That was 1863. This is 2023. What did we see this year? Political chaos, racial tension, war and violence. Those are just some of the headlines. I mean, we might agree with Longfellow. There is no peace on earth, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But listen, 
Listen, God's not surprised by any of this. God is fully aware of what's going on, and he is still the sovereign of this world. Amen? He is in control, and he will bring his peace. Longfellow knew that. And that's why the last verse of his song says this. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Friends, Longfellow was right. God is not dead. He is not asleep. The wrong will fail. The right will prevail. For those who are in Christ, we have peace. So I want to conclude tonight with a couple quotes from some preachers. The first preacher happens to be the one who preached for you here. If you were here December the 10th, um, his name was Michael Berg. I don't know Michael. Does he happen to be here tonight? All right, he preached for you on uh, that Sunday, a couple Sundays ago. Tremendous message. I watched all of it. It was, it was great. And this is what he said as he quoted Micah 5, and he shall be their peace. Michael said, let me remind you of something. Peace is not an ideal. It's not ultimately a goal or the result of a treaty. Peace is ultimately a person, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the Christ. And then he asked all of you to say amen. And what I heard on the video was everybody saying amen. And the second preacher I want to conclude with goes back 2,000 years to the Apostle Paul. And this is what the Apostle Paul said. Do not be anxious for anything. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. My prayer for you at Christmas is that you will experience the peace that passes all understanding of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we live in a world that longs for the reality of your presence. For some, peace seems so far away. Lord, we, we long to draw close to you and to have your peace fill our hearts. So would you release us from bitterness, anger, resentment, help us to forgive as you forgave, and be filled with your peace this year at Christmas time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Every Christmas, we like to tell the Christmas story. Um, also, this is not Chuck Legvold. This is Bob Hendrick. If you haven't met him, he's great, awesome. Chuck, unfortunately, had COVID, um, and so we are praying for him constantly. But um, thankfully, Chuck has also worked on some stuff, and we want to read the Christmas story for you all. So let's do it. This is the story of Christ. Ever since man and woman fell from the grace of Eden, God has been speaking to fallen and hopeless humanity about how he would raise them up and give them hope. But few had heard the promises clearly. Then along came Isaiah, priest and prophet, and his encounter with God in the temple opened his eyes and ears, his mind and mouth, until God could speak to him in unmistakable clarity. This is Isaiah 9-6. For to us a child is born... To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Years, decades, and centuries would then pass where it seemed like silence pervaded the whole earth. 
But God was working in those quiet generations, reading trust and calling for hope among his people. His heart had never stopped longing for the redemption of his creation. And out of his heart flowed a simple but unimaginable plan that God's Son would be the Redeemer who would be sent into the broken creation to remake and renew all that had been destroyed and to restore light in the world darkened by sin. This is John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. At just the right time, God's Son was sent forth into the world in a most unexpected way. Through a willing partnership with a fallen yet faithful human being, a young woman living in a backwater town and committed to be married to a simple craftsman, a miracle took place. Holy Spirit and willing person cooperating to bring a promise into being, a promise that would wed the fullness of divinity with the fullness of humanity, without either one diminishing the other. And so, a one-of-a-kind child was conceived in the womb of a believing handmaiden, a child who would fulfill the promise of God and reconcile creator and creation. This is Luke 1, 26 through 28. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting that might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This miracle would not go unnoticed, but it would be misrepresented and misunderstood by others. Girls don't just conceive a child, and those who do outside of marriage would be considered with something much less than pity. Then, as it was with Mary, so it would be with her promised husband. And the angel of the Lord came and spoke to him in his sleep and told him of his own part in the keeping of God's promise. It was enough for the carpenter. He obeyed God protected and loved Mary, and assured that this miraculous child to be born would not only fulfill God's promise, but that the child's name would demonstrate that promise. His name would not be that of Joseph's tradition, but that of God's grace. Yeshua, Jesus, the God who saves. And this is Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive, shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. This is the story of Christ. Amen. Thank you. could have stepped into creation with fire for all to see, brought every tribe and nation to their knees, arriving with the host of heaven in royal robe and crown, the rulers of the earth all bowing But you chose meekness over majesty, wrapped your power in humanity, so glory be to you alone, King who reigns from a manger throne, my life life they never know but you wrote a better story in humble Bethlehem creator in the arms of common man and you chose meekness over majesty wrapped your power in heaven and nature sing this is our king but the grave couldn't hold him and our God is overcome let heaven and nature sing this is our king from heaven to the cradle from the cradle to the cross let heaven and nature sing this is our king Jesus. 
Jesus, that king on a manger throne. Mm This is the final candle of the Advent wreath, the Christ candle. I light the Christ candle to remind us that Christ the Messiah has come and he brings his light and life to everyone. I invite Pam and Jim and their friends to come now and they'll pass the flame to everyone in the congregation. stand in this moment as we also sing Silent Night together. May you be filled with the wonder of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the Magi, and the peace of the Christ child. Christmas blessing to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. Please say Merry Christmas to somebody on your way out.
Boy, you guys really sounded pretty up. 